Um, what did I miss? A lot. Uh... I think he was JF may be coming in here either shortly, but I told to uh, ask yourself that I have to leave it uh, in about 25, 25, 28 minutes. So, but then I said I'd be on after 8.30 if JF wants to talk with me. That'd, that'd be interesting. Sure. We he's going to get things. more. He's going to get far more confrontation than he got from uh, Jay Dyer. Besides this exchange with Dyer, is he particularly well <laughs> known on YouTube? Yeah, he was. You should just he start does. where Jay Dyer left off. Mm. Where he said no, I just really no. Hard. I'll just listen. <laughs> no, I'll just. It's very simple. I'm going to just simply start. I'm just going to simply present the uh, self-disclosure of the Christian God. Either he's familiar with it or not. And upon re uh, rejection, it's all downhill for that, for the, from there. Because they want, they, wa they want the Christians to play the evidentialist game, where the Christian keeps on going, but God exists, but God exists. Look at all the beautiful creatures. Look at the fine-tuning of the universe. And they go, uh-uh-uh, uh-uh-uh. I wouldn't get into it with them on evolution specifically. Well, actually, I was going to mention, I recall, I saw a conversation between JF and, and somebody else, and they asked him what he thought the best evidence for evolution was. And he said, I'm not going to get the phrasing right, but this is just a paraphrase. He said something about how it's the similarity in genes between different species <laughs> or different <laughs> organisms or something. Yeah. So, so what that, so that, that may, yeah. But how about, how about, the, how about the severe mitigating evidence that the idea that random mutations could build genes from scratch is nowhere absurd. Beneficial mutations are mutations that produce a novel effect on pre-existing gene sequences or allele frequencies. There's, there's no observational support that mutations can build new genes unless, of course, somebody wants to talk about gene duplication. But that doesn't explain where you get all the genes for your brain, your kidneys, your pancreas from uh, the, the genome of a microorganism. There's a lot of stuff against evolution. They, they see. There, there, there's one little. There's a big elephant in the room. It's that random mutations, given it an, a, enough time that a fortuitous random beneficial mutations can build the genome. There's no observational support for that. They, and they want to believe in a grand universe with billions or trillions of planets that, that that will provide enough trials to overcome the improbability. It will not. I've even factored in a trillion, trillion Earths that will do nothing for enough trials for random mutations to even produce a protein. The similarity is also overblown. Um, if they say we're ninety-eight percent similar to to monk uh, to chimps, but that's only in regards to two percent of our entire genome. So the most you could is in terms of two percent of our genome, we share ninety-eight percent likeness. But even then, it's not 98%. It got contaminated. I think it's more like 80 And that's only referring to the protein coding regions. Uh, Darth, that I think Mu-ha-ha-ha-ha, uh, he wants to debate you on evolution. Go before, ahead. Before you guys start on that, I just got a quick question. Like, If you juxtapose evolution in terms with presuppositionalism, are you guys like... Oh, he's muted, super Darth. He wants to be unmuted so he can school you on evolution. Like, when you just suppose evolution with presuppositionalism, are you guys, like, superficially granting them, like, certain things in order to converse with them about evolution? You've been redeemed, Muahaha. Wait, what? Did you hear my question? 
I'm free. Yeah, go ahead. I have yep. 25 minutes. Yo, Doc, I have a quick question for you. So, what do you want to know? I have a quick question. Hold on. Go ahead, Tom. We juxtapose evolution with presuppositionalism. Like, when you have a conversation with someone about evolution, are you, like, superficially granting them, like, the laws of logic and the laws of nature and stuff like that? Well, I could, I could just simply talk about, you know, the basic biological facts which is which is a devastating line of reasoning against evolution, but I can go the presuppositional route too because they don't have any basis for science. They're going to need a, a foundation of science first to talk about evolution, and they don't have one. Because usually when I hear you talk about evolution, you just stick on like the scientific reasoning, it's like as if they're already um, accepting just for the superficial. I, I, I just do it what I'm in the whatever I'm in the mood for. Sometimes oh, yeah. I just talk about yeah. Sometimes I'll just talk about what they think the facts are because they're so, they're so brainwashed. You know, they go through the public school system, undergraduate work, and they're so brainwashed. You know, with 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 the pseudo evidence of evolution. You know, it's it's sad. So oh, go ahead. Well, um, I just uh, noticed the comment of Conholio where he just said uh, there's a lot of stuff against evolution. I want to hear that. Yeah, there's no there's no reason to believe that random mutations can build the genome. And from a purely mathematical standpoint, it's 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 as the most improbable uh, of an event that you could ever quantify. So there's no reason. Yeah. See, in order to, in order to go from microorganisms to the most advanced life forms, including humans, you need something. You need to account for the um, where all the new complex the hierarchical complex anatomy and physiology came from. So you're going to have to explain how mutations could, could possibly build the genome. What observational support? You see, you just take that for granted that mutations will incrementally. You see, you get that, you got that initially from Charles Darwin because, because this idea took on a life of its own because Charles Darwin, you know, observed the finches on the Galapagos Islands. He thought, oh, well, small changes could take place and at least to survival. But what he observed in no way is a justification for uh, macro evolution. Okay. So y you are actually denying macro evolution, but except micro evolution. Well, that's, okay, microevolution, and if by that we mean that there's biological change in offspring, yeah, well, no, but nobody disputes that. So, for example, suppose a finch on the Galapagos Islands uh, is born, and it has a longer rather than a shorter beak, and there's a drought, and it can reach down and get the seeds and crevices. Those finches that have the shorter beaks will tend not to survive. But there's plasticity within within the the what is called what, you know within the genotype and the phenotype, where certain traits can be more more survivable, right? But that doesn't that's not talking about mutations building a new gene uh, a genome or new complex anatomy and physiology that didn't already exist. Well, it's. It's, as it said, a very long process, you know, uh, like the development of the eye. Have you read stuff on this? Yeah. All you're simply telling me is you're giving me an evolutionary story. That's, yeah, that's a nice make-believe story. Yeah. Well, yeah, um, to directly did you, did you observe did you, what did you, you observe? Did you, oh, so, well, did you observe this? Uh, I, I bet nobody can because it's a very long process. Oh, then, ha then, ha then, then how do you how do you, how do you know this process can actually occur? Uh, because we are seeing little changes, and yeah, that's begging uh, the ones the question. who are beneficial. That's begging. That's begging the question. Nobody disputes that there can be minute changes. That does not justify. That random mutations. Listen, I could take look. For example, we could have let's say a mobile game on your smartphone, right? And it could load and have some a glitch in it, 
that might produce a novel effect that gives you an advantage in gameplay. But the fact that you can have a, a mistake in the code that produces a novel effect to cause you to perform better in the game does not mean that uh, random mistakes at, a, at the most uh, foundational informational level can produce to code from scratch computer programs. Okay? That's begging the question. Okay? Do you understand? Uh, yes, I do. Um, so you want direct observation? No, I want you to give me a good line of reasoning as to why I should believe there's a universal common ancestry. Why do you believe it? Well, I'll tell you why you believe it. That's because that's the way you've been brainwashed by Western civilization and even part of the East. Okay, The theory of evolution has become a dominant paradigm uh, in the scientific community and scientific academia because they have adopted an atheistic paradigm starting with Charles Darwin. And because it is ubiquitous, it is seemingly almost everywhere, you've come to believe that, well, these are men of science. These are men of truth. They're not, these people are not peddling uh, me religion or metaphysics. Oh, yes, they are. It is metaphysics in terms of a biological origin claiming to be science. Now, give me your most compelling line of reasoning or evidence for a universal common ancestry. Not just a just-so story, this is how it happened. Give me your most compelling piece of evidence of a universal common ancestry. Well, I'm obviously not a biologist, but uh, there, there are multiple things things that are true about evolution. I'm waiting for your most compelling piece of evidence that persuaded you that there was a universal common ancestry that is not the product of a fiat creation. Go ahead. Uh, well, let's take the uh, bone structure and mammals. Yeah, what you're referring to is homology. The fact that there are similarities in body parts and structures does not logically necessitate a common ancestry. A common ancestry would be consistent in similarity in anatomical features, but that, that does not necessarily indicate that because we see that we could also explain that as common design, sir. Right? Do well, we see, do we no, see, no, 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 do no. we see, hold common. on a second. Do we see a, do we see common computer code and common physical design in various iPhones? Yeah, we do. Because they're all designed. And yes, they are therefore completely the same. <laughs> I'm listen, I'm still waiting. Saying that there are similarities in anatomical features does not indicate that there's a universal common ancestry. That that may be consistent with it, but it doesn't mean that it happened. Charles Darwin said that if the fossil record in 100 years doesn't bear out his theory, his theory will has collapsed. Well, the fossil record has not demonstrated a, a universal common ancestry. And in fact, the fossil record exemplifies, and I will use a term that evolutionary paleontologists use, the fossil record exemplifies stasis, not transition. The animals that we find appear abruptly and they disappear abruptly without tr numerous transitional forms, which is, is an argument against evolution. They are bewildered. They do not know why there are all these missing transitional forms. Well, fossilization happens really rarely. Right, so sure. Then, uh, how come we don't? How come we don't have some rare instances of some transitional forms, other than appealing to maybe tectalic or archaeopteryx? And by the way, tectalic has now been debunked. Okay, we, we we don't we don't see transitional forms unless, of course, you want to go to a museum and they put all of these skeletons of aqua what appear to be aquatic creatures in order. That doesn't show that they they evolve from one another. 
That's an artistic representation. I'm still waiting. What is your compelling evidence that there's a universal common ancestry? Because if you can't give me an answer to that right now, it will be evidence that you have been brainwashed because there is a universal um, adoption of a materialistic paradigm of biological origins. Okay, just because it's ubiquitous and it's dominant. If you know anything about the history of philosophy of science, just because a paradigm of how something is or or was is uh, held in wide consensus, it's no guarantee that it's true. Because there are corpses of scientific paradigms that used to be widely held that are no longer held. Okay, I'm sure you don't hold to the steady state theory, do you? In cosmology, well. That, that, that was one of the prevailing cosmological paradigms until somebody observed the redshift in the background cosmic radiation. Oops. So what is your compelling evidence that there is a universal common ancestry? Because similarity in skeletal remains does not show, uh, necessitate a, a common ancestry. Okay. Well, maybe I can show it to you. I'm not a biologist. Oh, but... okay. Well, now you now you're now you're now no, no, you're no, no, no. now you're proof positive to me of the brainwashing that has gone on in in the world today. You see, at the time during the toward the end of the late 19th century when Charles Darwin came along the scene, Charles Darwin basically wrote in his journals that if his theory succeeded, he will have succeeded at murdering God. The theory of evolution is basically atheism, okay? Right? It is stealth atheism. Now, well, are there people it's who believe... It's believable. Are, are, n n uh, well, well, why is it believable? Give me your evidence. Why do you believe it? Do you believe it because that's what you were taught? Do you believe it because... It is held in wide consensus because just because something's held in wide consensus doesn't make it true. Now, vestigial organs. Oh, okay, good. Give me a vestigial organ, sir. Uh, my appendix. Okay, now, see, you have been so brainwashed. Do you know that the appendix is no longer considered to be a vestigial organ, that it's, it, it's a part of the immune system? The appendix is used in utero to develop the immune system, and it also functions as a, a reservoir of beneficial bacteria. Now, did you know a couple of dec ago, decades ago they had no idea that the appendix, all right, was a reservoir of beneficial bacteria? Now, do you know why? That, that that is that's functional is because when you have a reservoir of beneficial bacteria it allows the that bacteria to continually fill the gut blocking out harmful bacteria okay and so whenever because they have adopted an evolutionary paradigm of origins whenever they come across a body part since they have already categorically rejected design if they don't know what it does they go, oh, well, it must be vestigial, like your tonsils. Oops, no, your tonsils are a part of your uh, immune system. Oh, well, the coccyx, well, that's a holdover from our tail. No, your coccyx is, is readily involved in help aiding you sitting down and, and standing up. And there are mu muscular uh, connections to the coccyx that aid you in relieving your bowel movements. You see, just because they tell you it's vestigial doesn't mean it is. Okay, do you believe that the spotted moths is a good argument for evolution? Muhaha? Uh, you mean the 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 ones Do you that believe? Are black? Yeah, yeah. The spotted moths was that a good line of reasoning for evolution? Well, it's certainly not an over compelling one, but it's still okay. Some has it is it used in all the text? Yeah, it's used in all the textbook. Well, do you know it was a fraud? the The guy who did the study actually glued the moths to trees. Moths don't hang out on trees during the daytime. Okay, now let's say that's the case. Let's say that the darker moths were not seen by birds. Okay, that that's fine. And let's say there was a mutation in the moth where its pigmentation became dark and they survived more because they weren't eaten by birds. So what? That doesn't show that random mutations can build the genome. 
Do you know what the odds of a mutation are in producing the correct coding sequences for one amino acid? Do you have any idea? Uh, the answer, it's, the it's answer is one. Very low, the, right? The answer is one in twenty. Now, one the coding sequence for one amino acid. You have to code for numerous amino acids in a, in a chain to produce uh, a protein. Now. The first coding sequence is 1 in 20. The second one combined with the first one is 1 in 400. The third one is 1 in 8,000. Now, each additional coding sequence that you have to add to the code causes the improbability of mutations to produce it to grow exponentially, not arithmetically. That sounds what do like you a think probability the, uh, fallacy. No, it's not a probability fallacy, sir. What it's simply pointing out is that the longer the informational sequence is, the longer, the more difficult it is to crack by chance. Now, uh, do you think you should pick a shorter or a longer password so that nobody cracks your 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 accounts? Do they tell you to do they tell you to do a longer or shorter one? Is it yeah, easier it to crack? Matter. It's is not it, impossible is it, is, to you're crack. Not, you're not. You're, you're, that's that's not the that's not the issue. The issue is not the it, it, that it's impossible. The issue is what what do you think the odds are for the simplest of proteins? Okay, for mutations to produce it, there are at least one hundred to one hundred and fifty amino acids in the least complex proteins out there. So, if each coding sequence for amino acid is one in twenty, right? You're 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 dealing in one in twenty to the one hundredth power. That's with a hundred zeros. Yeah. Do you so have it? Do you have any, happen, right? do, do you have, no? The the issue the the issue is from a purely mathematical or statistical point of view. It is as remote probabilistically as anything that you could quantify. By the way, that's just for one protein. Do you have any idea of how many proteins and other complex sequences are needed in the ge in the genome of even a a simple bacterium? And each one of those individual molecular components have a mathematical improbability. But you see, you don't care about that. Why? Because you've never been taught about it. Because the people who taught you and the people who taught them don't care about the improbability because they've already drunk the Kool-Aid that evolution happened over millions of years. And why do they have that? It's because atheism has taken over in academia and the sciences starting at the round of Charles Darwin. I got to go. Hey, ask yourself, are you getting uh, JF in here to debate him sometime? Hello? Yeah, he's gone? Is it fair, son?